Okay, let's talk about heritage uh, tourism a little bit. This is a, a big thing in the, in the Ozarks and has been for several years. Again, part of what draws some people to the Ozarks is this, this kind of hillbilly image of the Ozarks, of the backwoods, country, rural spirit of the Ozarks. And that's been drawing people to the Ozarks for, for a long time. And we, we can go back... One of the first examples of heritage tourism that we can go back to is in the 1930s when the folk festivals start. Of course, we have lots of festivals nowadays, and even here at Missouri State, we have a, an Ozarks, what's it called, cultural or celebration festival or something like that every, every September here on campus. And the roots of those go way back. Uh, in, in American history, they go back at least to the 1920s when you had your first folk festivals in Appalachia that celebrated uh, mountain music, old-timey music that we talked about earlier in the semester, and sometimes uh, old-timey dance, you know, jig dancing and, and, and stuff like that, and uh, sometimes crafts and things. But the first folk festivals were held in the Ozarks in 1934, and let me see. The first one was held in Eureka Springs that year, and then there were other regional festivals scattered across the Ozarks. They were in Rolla and West Plains and Aurora, Missouri. And then after th those four festivals were held, they sort of gathered the best banjo pickers and the best white oak basket makers and all that kind of stuff from the four festivals in Eureka and, and Rolla and West Plains and Aurora and had like a regional festival in Springfield. And then... Later in 1934, the National Folk Festival was held in St. Louis that year. And eventually, the Depression and then World War II sort of slows down interest in the festival movement, but it, but it springs back up after the war, and you get the creation of the Ozark Folk Festival in Eureka Springs. It starts in 1948 and continues to this day. Again, mostly music with a little dance thrown in and some crafts and, and things like that. Uh, and then the Arkansas Folk Festival starts in 1963 in Mountain View, Arkansas, and it's still going on. They just had theirs last month. They always do it, I think it's the third weekend in April, something like that. And then that the Arkansas Folk Festival helps uh, create the Ozark Folk Center in Mountain View in 1973, and that is still in operation today, now 40 years later. And other examples of heritage tourism, Silver Dollar City, which opened in 1960, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, and Dog Patch USA. Does anybody remember Dog Patch? Down in Arkansas. Butch, did you say you, you, you passed by the what's left of it? No, there's still, a lot of the buildings and stuff are still there. It's been closed now for 20 years, but uh, the theme park, uh, it was kind of a hillbilly theme park. Uh, sounds, sounds great, and it was, you know. What's better than a hillbilly theme park? You know, I can't think of very many things. Uh, with, the, with the craze that America obviously has for for reality TV shows about backwood Southerners. It can only be a matter of time before we have a comeback of a hillbilly redneck theme park. So, you know, we may, we, Silver Dollar City. Well, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of grown past that. But it, in the beginning, you know, it was, it, was, it was a little bit like that. Speaking of Silver Dollar City, the background of that is the Hershen family who still own Silver Dollar City and lots of other stuff around the country, they had uh, they bought Marvel Cave, which originally was called Marble Cave, and they were running that in the 1950s. The Hershens were from Chicago, I believe, from some, somewhere up north. They'd moved down. They were running this cave, and it was a pretty popular attraction. It was, it was popular enough by the late 50s that they were having long lines of people waiting to tour this cave. The cave, the same cave that's underneath Silver Dollar City today. And they came up with this idea 
of building this little faux town, this little pretend late 1800s frontier town at the mouth of the cave for people to kind of mill around in to give them something to do while they were waiting to get into the cave. And that's how Silver Dollar City started. That little faux frontier town opened in 1960. There were five buildings originally, and it grew from there. And now I'm sure there are thousands of people who go to Silver Dollar City and don't even realize there's a cave underneath it because that's not what they're there for anymore. And, you know, I, so a lot of people go to the cave, but most people who go to Silver Dollar City don't ever even think about a cave and don't go to the cave. So that's how it starts in 1960. And you can see here's a picture of the original crew back in 1960. And they had, of course, they had their stagecoach and they, they did a little uh, like holding up a stagecoach sort of thing. They still do some of the same things that they did uh, back, you know, back 50 something years ago, carry on some of those traditions, but it, uh, it's obviously grown well beyond that. And part of, the, part of the, the spirit of this Silver Dollar City in the early days was, again, that heritage tourism idea, uh, playing up the kind of frontier heritage of the Ozarks. Now, what Silver Dollar City did was mixed kind of hillbilly mythology with the Wild West. We are talking about 1960, the heyday of the Western on television, when, you know, Westerns on TV in 1960 were like reality shows are in 2013. You know, every, two out of every three shows was a Western back in those days, and, and people were fascinated with Westerns and all that kind of stuff. So Silver Dollar City kind of mixed, kind of jumbled up the two, Ozark history and the history of the Wild West and, and uh, capitalized on that. But it was a kind of a heritage thing. And today we know Silver Dollar City still has some of the elements of those earlier days with the, the people in granny dresses and the, uh, the crafts people who were making stuff and you know, dressed up in old-timey clothing and stuff like that. And then they do obviously do lots of stuff from uh, roller coasters to international festivals that have nothing to do with the early days of Silver Dollar City. They're just kind of things that theme parks do. And Silver Dollar City is popular enough and successful enough that we saw that it made the top 10 of Missouri's most visited destinations by itself. And, uh, but it has, uh, it's managed to hold on to, to some of its heritage tourism tradition while offering lots of other stuff that attracts people who aren't the least bit interested in people making walking canes and, and homemade fiddles and, and stuff like that. And then the last thing we've got, spiritual tourism in the Ozarks. And this, was, this involves, uh, you could throw, I guess, the precious, was that precious moments or precious memories? Precious moments. moments, the little figurine people over in, are they in Carthage or Joplin? Carthage. In Carthage. Uh, you could throw them in here too, but, but the, the big outfit when we talk about spiritual tourism in the last 50 years has been the growth of Eureka Springs, just one more element to the, a very strange mix of, of tourist appeals there in, in Eureka Springs. It starts almost 50 years ago when, uh, when publisher Gerald L.K. Smith, who uh, is quite a, quite, nowadays quite a notorious figure, he was uh, anti-Semitic, and uh, made part of his fortune publishing these anti-Semitic publications and, and stuff like that. Well, he, can't, he bought a place in Eureka Springs and helped resurrect the fortunes of a declining town, even though many of the people in the town didn't like him, didn't like what he stood for. Uh, he built the Christ of the Ozarks in the late 60s, which is pictured there. Not a, not a great work of art. The scale's a little bit off in some ways. Uh, but uh, this is built, and then, of course, uh, more, more popular than the Cross of the Ozarks, the Passion Play that he founds and opens in the late 60s and draws, eventually draws hundreds of thousands of people 
uh, to Eureka Springs and continues to this day to draw people to Eureka Springs. For, uh, they were shutting it down. They were in the process of shutting it down, but then they eventually they raised enough money to yeah. keep it going. Yeah. For, yeah. for, finan for financial reasons. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. But they, yeah. they kept it going. Is yeah. He, is he still living? No, no. I, I think he died years. I, I think he was pretty old in 64 when he, when he uh, found Eureka Springs. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it seems like you don't hear as much about the passion play as you used to, and that may be a reflection of its declining fortunes. Maybe, you know, there's only so many repeat customers they can draw in there, and, and I'm not sure if it's just not as popular as it once was or, or what, you know. Or the, or the rest of weird Eureka Springs scares off the clientele who would normally go to the passion play. I really don't know. But they've also got the Bible Museum there, and sort of, you know, like a little miniature, you know, kind of, uh, oh, yeah, the Holy Land thing. But again, Eureka Springs is, you know, it's, it's the tourist town that you just can't kill. You know, it, it just rein, it finds ways to reinvent itself. And it, and it reinvents itself in so many different ways for different audiences. You know, the same place that attracts thousands and thousands of Christians every year is the same place having the rainbow parade and, and the bikers and, and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just, a, it's remarkable that, they, that they've been able to do what they do, I guess.